Give us hearts to receive, the will to obey. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can make your way back to your seats. Thanks so much, worship team. We'll get you back up in a little while. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thanks so much for having such a spirit of worship in your hearts tonight, making the Lord feel welcome in our midst. Appreciate the worship team leading the way. Judges chapter six, my heart has been absolutely flooded during worship with message after message after message. I just want to go in the direction the Lord wants. My plan is not to preach long. So as soon as I feel I've delivered what has to be delivered, we'll we'll come back around the altar to, to, to meet with the Lord and see what he wants to do. Judges 6, there's amazing interaction here between Gideon and an angel of the Lord. Beginning in verse 1, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So this was the pattern. Israel would turn away from God and worship idols, and as a result, they would come under judgment And then when things would get really bad, they would cry out to God again. This was the cycle. Verse 2, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came And sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So get this picture. Gideon is doing what would normally be done in the open. He's doing it in hiding in an unlikely place for fear of the Midianites. Because if they see what's happening, they will come and steal all the crops, all the produce. It would would be like at work, you're in a hostile environment and people hate the gospel. So when it's time to read the word, you you go in a a closet and close the door and and, and use your cell phone or or just use a flashlight to, to look at your Bible. You're doing it in hiding for fear of the consequences. And look at this. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, if I had been Gideon, I might have thought that the angel was mocking me. Here I am threshing wheat in the wine press for fear of the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord says, you're a mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. I might have thought he was being sarcastic. Oh, yeah, mighty warrior here in hiding, here reading the Bible in the closet. Mighty warrior. That's what I might have thought. But the Lord meant what he said. 
And Gideon's response is amazing. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? When the, when the angel said to Gideon, the Lord is with you, Gideon, thinking like an Israelite, said that if he's with me and this is my people, then the Lord is with us. And if the Lord is with us, why are we in this condition? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. If God's really with us, things should be different. If God's really with us, we shouldn't be fleeing from our enemies. If God's really with us, then, then for ancient Israel, we should be the head and not the tail. And, and look at what the angel says to him. Go in the strength you have. It says the Lord, so speaking through the angel, the Lord directly says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? What was the strength that Gideon had? Some said, well, that he was a mighty warrior on the inside, and that's what God was drawing on, and that's what he needed to take hold of. There could be truth to that, but I think there was something else going on. When the Lord said to him those words, in Hebrew, it's just three words, Lech b'kochachazeh, go in this your strength. What was Gideon's strength? It was recognizing that if God was really with his people, things should be different. It was the revelation that something was missing. It was the understanding that God's presence in the midst of his people makes a difference. Now, I want you to go with me to Acts, the first chapter. Acts chapter 1. Very familiar passages to many of us. Luke's gospel ends with the disciples praising God in the temple after the resurrection. But Jesus says to them in Luke 24, 49, stay here, stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Think of it. They've been with Jesus over three years. He's discipled them. He sent them out on missions. They've ministered in the power of the spirit. They've seen him die. They've seen him rise. He has opened their mind to understand the scriptures. Luke 24 tells us that. And yet, they were not ready to go. There was something they did not yet have. And he says, stay in the city until you're endued with power from on high. So now we get to Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, so Luke writing, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Well, you think they're ready to go. I mean, how more ready could they be? What else would they need to experience? They've been with the risen Jesus 40 days after his resurrection. Nobody's been more equipped. Nobody's been better instructed. Nobody's been better prepared. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in the words of John in Matthew 3.11, it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire often accompanying the Spirit, the glory, the power of God in the Scriptures. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, the way some people teach on this, it was the most idiotic and stupid question because God was finished with Israel and the church had replaced Israel and there were no future promises for Israel. If that had been the case, Jesus would have rebuked them. Jesus would have said, stupid question. I've been with you 40 days after my resurrection. I was with you three plus years before that and you still don't get it. 
There is no future for Israel. God's cast Israel away. No, that's not what he said, because that's not the case. The promises to Israel are not canceled by the Messiah. They're confirmed by the Messiah. So he doesn't rebuke the question. He says this, good question, great question. But it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Yes, God will fulfill his purposes for Israel, but that's God's business in terms of the dates and the times. That's not what you should be focusing on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the focus. And you cannot go and complete the mission without that spiritual power. It's that simple. And Paul understood this. Brilliant Paul, who could out-debate his contemporaries, who had a massive knowledge of Scripture. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, here he is in this cosmopolitan city, famous for its, its great speakers and great philosophers. And what does he say in 1 Corinthians 2? When I came to you, I didn't come with impressive or, or persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 19, the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. The same power that was on Jesus in unlimited form is given to us in limited form. Each one with a particular gift or a particular anointing or a particular grace, but without the power of the Spirit, we cannot do the work of God. Some will say, you don't understand. The moment we're saved, we receive everything we need. The moment we're saved... The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. We're baptized in the Spirit. We receive everything we need. There's nothing subsequent to ask for. Fine, just show me. If you have it, demonstrate it. I'm not concerned with how you get it or when you get it, just that you have the fullness of what God wants in your life. I heard a fellow teaching on radio several decades ago, and he said when a little baby is born, that baby is very small, but that baby does not need to grow another leg or grow another arm or grow another head. That baby has everything it needs at birth. It just needs to grow. He said it's the same with a believer. The moment you're saved, you have everything you need. All you have to do is grow. Well, there's some truth to that, but not fully. I asked Leonard Ravenhill, how would you respond to that? And he smiled and said, I've never seen a baby born that was fully clothed. That's even an expression in the Bible about Gideon. He was clothed with the Spirit. There is something of God coming upon us as believers. There is something of God imparting something to us as believers and taking us to a deeper place. And you can read in the past about, about leaders like, like D.L. Moody, who was not a tongue speaker. But here he was in ministry knowing there had to be more. You know, you read the Word and then you look at what's happening in the church, you say, something's not lining up here. Oh, thank God for where he is moving and the power of God's being demonstrated. But in so many places, there's no real clear demonstration of the power of God to set captives free and change lives. And the question I often challenge myself with before the Lord and pray about it for my own life and ministry, where is the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus in my life. There are many nice people that before weren't nice, something happened in their lives, they become nice. Or people that were addicted to things and something happens in their life and they're no longer addicted. That can happen without the power of the gospel. But there are many things that can only happen through the power of the gospel. And, and if, if you're called to different parts of the world where, where it's really hard ground and people don't respond to your message or you're, you may be in America and you're just in a region that has rejected the Lord and is very hard, your best sermons don't do it. Your, your best presentations and, and your, your smartest social media stuff, it only goes so far. And you get to that point, you say, where is the power of the gospel? 
The same God in the Bible is the same God today. The same spirit that was on Jesus is the same spirit on us. The same word that was on the lips of the apostles, it, it's here. God is not offended by us crying out for more. He's honored by it. When I was a little boy, I went with my family to an amusement park that was in Coney Island in Brooklyn. It was famous back in the day. And there was this, this lift where you had a parachute over you and you'd sit down on the little chair and then the thing would go straight up. It just had a cable on top of it. You weren't gonna fly away. But it would open up and go straight up and you go all the way up in the air. I don't know how many feet. And you'd come down. And I, I was a little scared. My sister, three and a half years older than me, was not scared of heights at all. I was a little scared, but, but I, I was doing all right. I, I, was, I, I was okay. And I uh, sat down, and I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I can do this. I can do this. And then one of the guys working at the place said to me, you're, you're sitting on, on the stool. You're, you're sitting on the stairs next to, you know, you're not actually on the ride. I thought I was doing okay, and it's about to go up any second. I'm doing all right. The moment the thing went up, I started crying. I was terrified. I mean, I looked up, and I just saw the parachute over me. I panicked. I was crying. I was doing okay sitting on the stairs. But when I actually got in the ride, it was something very, very different. Some of us think that we're in the fullness, and it's everything, and we're flowing. And God's like, you haven't even gotten on the ride yet. There is, there is so much more. Just we haven't experienced it. We haven't known it. We haven't seen it. Look, to, to most people, I'm tall. But you put me around NBA players, I, I'd be one of the little guys. It's all relative. You don't have to be that tall to be the center on the pygmy basketball team. You hear what I'm saying? If we compare ourselves to ourselves and get all excited about comparing ourselves to ourselves, we'll never come into the fullness of God. He has places to bring us that are so beyond our understanding and things to do through us that would stagger us. Why? So he can be glorified. So we realize this, it's not us. It's not our flesh. It's not our power. It's not our wisdom. It's not our ability. It's not our, 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 our voice or our singing range or our musical skills or, or our talking skills. It's the power of God that sets people free. It's an encounter with God that transforms them. And, and we bring it by faith. We bring it by prayer. We bring it by crying out. We bring it by declaring the realities of the word. And when we don't see results and when we don't see answers, rather than bringing the standard down, rather than changing what's written, we get on our faces and say, God, something's missing. God, there must be more. We do what Gideon did. Sir, Lord, uh, if you're really with us, where is the evidence? Please hear me. We are not asking for God to work to help us because we don't have faith. Quite the contrary. It's because we have faith, we know there's more. We're not leaning on a crutch. Oh, I have to feel God today. If I don't feel something, I can't believe. No, we're not immature little babies. But because we have faith and we lay hands on the sick and they're not healed, it's like something's not right. What's the easy thing? Change your theology. I guess God doesn't heal anymore. That's the easy thing to do, and we often do it unconsciously. Some years ago, I, I had a, a major difference with, with one of the, the nation's top pastors in terms of his rejection of the things of the Spirit for today, and he wrote a book against it. I wrote a book for it, for the Spirit today. A man of God that I honor, but we had strong differences there. And, and I had a chapter in the book called Sola Scriptura, which is a famous term in, in modern church history and among those that believe in the, the Reformation, Scripture alone. So our, our, our final authority is not church tradition. It's not outside revelation. It's Scripture alone. That's our, that, that is our information in terms of who God is and how we live. That's our final authority. 
So the chapter is called Sola Scriptura and therefore charismatic. In other words, because the word of God is my sole authority, then I'm captive to what the word says. And because the word of God plainly declares that these things are for today, that healing and miracles and, 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 and seeing the gifts of the spirit manifest, that these things are for today, regardless of what I see, I have to believe the word. In other words, if I pray for 100 people to be healed in Jesus' name and none of them are healed, I still believe God's the healer because it's written. So I say, God, there's got to be more. Something's missing. I began to hear from people who said to me, I have to admit, your teaching was so clear. I, I'm convicted again. This is what the word said. But I had bad experiences in Pentecostal charismatic churches. You know, they said my dad was going to be healed and he wasn't. Or these people prophesied over me and the prophecies were off. So based on my bad experience, this is what they were saying, I threw out what the word says. I'm always being told, oh man, you just base your faith on experience. No, quite the contrary. I base my faith on what's written in the word. And because of what's written in the word, I say, God, there must be more. And God's honored by that. Because we're saying, Lord, based on who you are and what you've done in history, and what you're doing in different parts of the world right now, that indicates to me that there's more that you want to do here. And there's more you want to do through me. And doesn't God want to move in such a way where we can't take credit for it? One reason we have so much boasting and pride in the church is because there's so little happening, we can take credit for it. But when God actually moves, you're on your face. And no flesh glories in his presence. And then in Acts, the second chapter, you know the story. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes. And he comes in an unexpected way. Sound like the blowing of a rushing violent wind fills the house with the city. Notice, fills the house. God takes over. And notice, there's intensity. This is a moment that you can mark something has happened. And then tongues of fire. Appear. There's the fire again. Maybe one night I'll preach about that. But the fire of God is seen throughout the whole Bible. Literally from Genesis to Revelation. Tongues of fire. They begin to speak new languages. It's more than they were expecting. No one's ever done this before. And there's no evidence that Jesus told them this is the way it's going to happen. We don't know that they knew that this was going to happen. Must have shocked them as much as anybody else. And then crowds coming. That's a 3,000 born again and added to the, to the body. Boom! Just like that. Preaching so powerful. Cuts to their heart. They cry out, men and brothers, what must we do? They're undone by the word. And it comes through the lips of a man who only a couple months earlier, not even a couple of months earlier, denied Jesus three times. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the spirit. I was preaching in Italy in the mid-90s. I was on a plane with, with my assistant and I hadn't reviewed the itinerary. He was taking care of all of that. I knew we were getting into Rome. And then normally we'd fly south into Sicily where I'd done most of my ministry. Every so often we'd, we'd fly north into like Milan or something like that. Sometimes we'd go over to Naples. So I said to him, so what's our next flight? He goes, no, we're driving from here. I said, no, I'm, I'm either in the north or in the south. Normally in the south, that's where most of our connections are. I said, no, it's... It's somewhere else, a place called Falerna. I said, never heard of it, never been there. It turned out it was a very dry and barren place spiritually. It turned out that the, the believers there were absolutely not united. The missions group couldn't even get a handful of pastors to come together in the same room and pray. And, and they had the missions team that we worked with had a big tent seated about 3,000. They had specifically picked that place so it would be different. It wouldn't be, okay, I'm here with these brothers because maybe, you know, the, only the folks in that region would come. 
or only the folks in this region would come. No, instead it was kind of the middle of nowhere and a place where everyone could come and, and be on neutral territory. And we had about 100 pastors come, which was a tremendous turnout and a few thousand people total. And the first service, we had morning service, then lunch together, then afternoon, late afternoon, just meeting with the pastors and leaders, Q&A, teaching Q&A, and then night service. So the first morning, powerful service, strong service, but I went kind of long. And afterwards, I said, brother, you can't do that because the big hotel where we're staying, they have lunch prepared at a certain time, and it's for everybody together. I said, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Got it. I'll, I'll do better next time. So we have lunch, and then afterwards, I meet with the pastors. We're downstairs in the hotel. It's kind of like a granite room, very, very cold feeling. And in front, just this long desk with, with mics. It almost looked like some, some political meeting or, or government meeting where you got all the mics and the translators up there. And, and the pastors just wanted to ask me about, well, what about that? We heard about, about unusual manifestations or people laughing or people. It's like, I don't really want to talk about that. Let me talk about what I'm seeing God do in revival and reality of the Holy Spirit's working and all that. And they just had all these other questions about the secondary stuff. And then at night, oh, powerful meeting at night. Felt like something was ready to break. Felt like we were really close. So the next day, I finished my message. I'm sure to end early today, so I won't go late, cut into the lunch schedule. There was one pastor who was on the platform as I spoke. He was kind of leaning forward the whole time, just, just sitting like this and, and just riveted to the message. So I, I just said, hey, I just want to pray for our brother here before we go to lunch. I just felt led to do it. So I had him stand. I went over to pray for him. It just it was my habit for, for some time when I pray for a brother just to put my fist in his stomach and just say, fire. So I, the moment I touch him, it's like a bomb went off. I mean, he, he didn't just gracefully like, praise the Lord. Kind of I mean, boom, he was out on his face, on his side. But that moment the spirit hit him, the spirit fell on the teens in the back of the tent. I'm talking about instant and I had been preaching from Acts 2. And my message was God comes suddenly. He comes in unexpected ways. And it's always more than we're expecting. And I mean, boom, the spirit fell on him. The spirit fell on in, in intercession. The kids in the back, the teens started groaning and crying out and travailing. Boom, just like that. I said, all right, all the leaders, I want you to come up. I want to pray for you. Because there were many others there, but I want to pray for the leaders. And the power of God fell. I had been to Italy many times at that point. And the power of God fell. They were just laid out. I'd never seen it happen like that in Italy. It was, it was like a tornado just swept through. Boom! They were laid out into the power of God. It was extraordinary. People had been there for decades and we have never seen God move like this. And literally, it was a half hour into it before I realized God just came suddenly. <laughs> the very thing I had just preached happened so suddenly. I didn't realize until a half hour into it. God just came suddenly. And I mean, they were impacted. They were touched. And, and these brothers did the falling in the spirit, getting overcome by the spirit was not part of their spiritual culture. They didn't believe in it. They hadn't seen it or experienced it. And certainly not like that. And I was, it was on the 10th floor and, you know, dusty and dirty and boom, the power of God fell. So we, you know, we finish, we make our way over to lunch. And then, of course, the Q&A time with the leaders afterwards, all they want to talk about is the falling and the shaking. You say, okay, well, praise the Lord. God moves like that sometimes, but that's not what I want to major on. Let me tell you how God's changing lives and so on. Okay. And then night service, powerful night service. Next morning, we had three meetings a day for, for three days. Another powerful morning service. And now the last afternoon with the pastors. Uh, Brother Mike, uh, what about the falling and the shaking? It's like, once again, Saying, Brother Mike, have you ever received holy laughter? Uh, Micah Brown, we have a question for you. You know, some with translators, some talking to me directly in English. Uh, do you ever see people barking like dogs? I said, in Pensacola, there are dogs barking on the street, but I've never seen a person bark like a dog in a meeting or ever. If I ever did, I'd rebuke it, though I've never seen it. I said, let me tell you what I have seen. And it was just fresh in my mind because it had just been a, a previous Friday at water baptism. 
young girl gets baptized. I, I want to live for Jesus for the rest of my life, so I'm, I'm getting baptized now. Okay, very sweet. She, she gets baptized. The next one, a few years old, she goes, that was my sister. I haven't really lived the best life, but now I really want to live for Jesus, so I'm getting baptized. Well, praise God, that was a little deeper. She's a little bit older. Now the next one, teenager, a little bit older teenager, crying, those are my sisters. I haven't lived for God, I was messed up, I was doing drugs, and came to the revival, and Jesus said, I just want to give the rest of my life to the Lord. So she's all touched. So at this point, you know, three straight in the family, we're, we're touched, we're starting to cry. And then out comes the mom. And, and she says, those, those are my daughters. She said, you know, my husband, he was working in drug rehab and turns out he was on drugs himself. He wasn't right with God. And last Christmas, he, he got a bonus, got his salary for Christmas, never came home. We never saw him. He took off, bought drugs. We never saw him. She said, I got so desperate because I lived in here. I, I came to this revival. I got saved. And when he, he finally called months later, I forgave him in Jesus' name. And, and I just want to live the rest of the summer. She's crying. We're all bawling at this point. And I'm telling the story. I'm crying, telling the story to the pastors in, in Italy. And now here comes the father. Here comes the dad. <laughs> He says, he says, I stole money. I stole the Christmas money for my kids. I didn't, I went off. I did drugs. I left the family. And he said, I, I finally had to call my wife. When I called her, she forgave me. It changed my life. Now he's crying. So we were all just bawling and just undone by what God's done. And my translator's crying. And as I'm saying this, suddenly, I mean completely out of the blue, suddenly, with these same pastors that are asking me about falling and shaking and holy laughter and dogs barking, the same ones, suddenly the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin weeping and sobbing and crying out to God and hugging each other and praying. And, and, and one of the missionaries with me said, Mike, you see those two guys there hugging each other, weeping? He said, I couldn't get them in the same room last week. They have so much animosity towards each other. They, they, he's, I couldn't get them in the same room. And there they are sobbing and hugging. I, I've, I've seen the Holy Spirit break out suddenly. I've been in meetings where, where someone was testifying, boom, just something happened. Or where I've been ministering and God begins to move suddenly. But I never saw anything that dramatic as in that room, in that setting, no worship team, no crowds, no emotion. Dead setting is questions, questions and skepticism and, and, and wondering about things. Boom, God breaks out. It, it changes your life. Things can happen in a moment of time when the presence of God is there. That a that hundred years of our best efforts can't, can't accomplish. So, so look, we have to live for God day by day. It's not always bells and whistles and excitement. We're in the trenches. We have to be disciplined. We read the word even when we don't feel like we're getting anything out of it. We commune with God in prayer even when it feels like he's not listening and that, that's the way it feels to us. We share the gospel with people faithfully even if they reject it. If one person comes to the Lord, we rejoice and are thrilled and, and we work with that one to disciple him. Normal life goes on, but that's not all of it. That's not all of it. And, and, and the more I've been with the Lord and the more I've seen him move over the years and the more I've seen the Holy Spirit break out, the more impossible it is for me to live without more of God. And that's my challenge to each of you. There's so much more that God wants to do in us and through us. There's so much that he wants to do through us that, that Jesus, Yeshua, will be glorified through. And that, that people that could never be touched, people that it seemed there was just a wall, they come running to the altar. They come running to get right with God. Just going to share a bit more and then we're going to pray together. In um, 1993, I went to India for the first time. Been there many times, just like Italy, many times, actually 27 times to each of those countries. 
was my first time there. My wife Nancy with me. We had a few other friends traveling together. A very intense schedule, day and night ministry, lots of, lots of travel across the country. Kind of difficult conditions in the places where we were going, but it was, it was sacred. It was extraordinary. Three weeks. And we closed up with meetings in, in, in the home city of the brother that, that we were working with, who's become one of my dearest friends on the planet over the years. We've literally risked our lives together preaching the gospel in India. Literally. Probably at least five of the men we laid hands on and sent out into the tribal villages have been martyred. Just a very sacred thing that I get to work with him in Vishakapatnam in Andhra Pradesh in India. So the last week, we were going to close out with meetings in his home city. But he decided to go to a place where they never have gospel meetings. He decided to go to, to these industrial grounds. And you could get about 5,000 people in. And to hold meetings there where it was just not the norm for the gospel. Just to kind of break into new territory. So it's the last night. The brother with me brings a short message. Then I get to bring the, the longer message. And I'm preaching on spiritual hunger. I'm, I'm preaching on spiritual desperation. Kind of a, a theme that's been with me for many, many years. Even coming out in a message like tonight. And suddenly... The power goes out for the audio. Lights are still on, but the audio goes out. And the guys are so desperate, scrambling, trying to fix it, that they're, all, I'll do, I'll do. they're like pushing, no, no, nothing's happening, no one's fixing it. They can't get the generator up, something's, something's gone. So I, I looked to, to the brother with me, because I was right at the end of my message. So I looked to my, my friend, Yesu Potom, and I said, brother, I feel like we should just call people up to pray. He said, I was seeing the same thing. So we start yelling at the top of our lungs because it's kind of a noisy area and you got 5,000 people so we couldn't be heard further back. And we said, if you're hungry for God, if you want to meet with God, come on up here. Come on up here. And, and their workers just went through the crowd yelling. Next thing, people literally started running. It was one of the more dramatic responses to an altar call I've seen. They literally start running. And from the back, as they start running to the front. And, and we had 45 minutes before the audio came back out. And the people just started crying out to God for revival, crying out to God for visitation. The brothers there said it was the greatest united prayer for revival that they'd ever had. I mean, intense, focused, crying out. And then right when we felt we were at the end, the, 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 the power came back on. And our voices could be heard and we closed things out. But, but I noticed, because I'm looking out in the field and there are the gates in the back. I'm noticing though, truck after truck stopping. They stop for a little while and they move on. Bus after bus stopping. They stop for a little while and they move on. So I figure they're just picking people up. There's a crowd, they're picking people up. And it's common in many of these countries, a truck comes by, you just climb on the back of the truck, they give you a ride. So that's what I thought was happening. But it was one after another, after another, after another. So I, I asked the next day, I asked my friend Yesu Potom, I said, what was with all those trucks and buses in the back? I guess they were picking people up. He goes, no, brother, because the word had gotten out. He said, no, brother. He said, as they drove by and they looked at the front, they saw people burning. They saw people on fire and they stopped to look at the sight. The people at the altar crying out to God from a distance because of the presence of God and the power of God there. From a distance, it looked like the people were literally burning. Jesus says about John the Immerser and John Five, he says, John was a lamp that burned and gave off light. Smith Wigglesworth said, we should be torches. I want to burn. I want to be a torch. I want the fire of God and the light of God to so burn through me and, and shine through me that it transforms people. That lives are literally set free 
and brought from death to life and the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've seen amazing things in these 50 plus years in the Lord. I've seen amazing things in America. I've seen amazing things around the world. I've seen amazing things in the last year. But all it does is whet my appetite for something greater and for something more. And this generation, especially the young generation that's grown up without a move of God, that's grown up with so many scandals in the church, that's grown up seeing so little demonstration of power, that's grown up with a bombardment from the media and social media and the schools and anti-God bombardment, they must have an encounter with God. They must have an encounter with the Spirit. And when they do, everything will change. Stand to your feet with me. Stand to your feet. Worship team, you can come back up. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And after I pray it, I'm going to give an invitation. And if the invitation is for you, then I want you to get right up here. And we'll just fill the whole front and the aisles. And we'll cry out to God together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to visit us tonight. You know, everyone in this place, those who don't even know you and those who love you with all their hearts, I ask you to meet each of us where we are and take us another step closer to where you want us to be. In the name of Jesus. If you say, I want to be a torch, I, I want to be a burning fire for God. I, I want the power of God demonstrated through my life. If that's you, just get up here and let's start to cry out to God. That's you, just come on up, come right up and get on your knees, you can stand, whatever. And let's just begin to lift our voices to him and say, oh God, start the work in me. Don't worry about your roommate, don't worry about your family, don't worry about your spouse right now, start the work in me. Oh God, there must be more. If the promises of the word are true, and they are. There must be more. Lord, burn out of me the uncleanness. Burn the sin out. Burn the fleshly addictions out. Burn the double-mindedness out. Burn the fear of man out. Burn the excuses out. Set me ablaze and glorify Jesus in me and through me. Glorify Jesus in me and through me. Get up as close as you can. Step out from wherever you are. If that's you, let's get up front. Let's seek his face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is some of your hearts tonight. If he does, journal it. Go home and write it down. God may give you a challenge. Write it down. Take hold of it. Come on, you're here for the Lord. Surely he wants to give you the desires of your heart that are holy in his sight. on a Tuesday night to say, God, I want to meet with you. Surely he wants to work. Surely he's not pushing you away. He's drawing you near.
you, God. I just want you to consciously before the Lord. Think of a, a literal altar that's right there. You just get up and lay yourself on that altar and say, Lord, I'm the living sacrifice. I'm completely given over to you. Everything I have is yours. My life, my reputation, my future, my goals, my possessions, everything I am, talents, abilities, weaknesses, everything. I'm yours, I belong to you. Come with your holy fire, God, and purge us. Come with your holy fire, God, and purify us. Come with your holy fire and empower us. Who else does God have to work through except people, yielded vessels? And he works through each of us in our weakness so it can be known that the excellency of the power is his. The more excuses you have as to why God can't use you, the more qualified you are because only he will get the glory through you. It's like this in his presence, something happens. We get marked. There's impartation, there's change, there's revelation. We never leave the same when we really drink his presence in deeply. 